This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Jason Xanthopoulos. Reginald by Saki. Reginald. I did it. I who should have known better. I persuaded Reginald to go to the McKillop's garden party against his will. We all make mistakes occasionally. They know you're here, and they'll think it's so funny if you don't go, and I want particularly to be in with Mrs. McKillop just now. I know, you want one of her smoke Persian kittens as a prospective wife for Wumples, or a husband, is it? Reginald has a magnificent scorn for details other than sartorial. And I am expected to undergo social martyrdom to suit the connubial exigencies. Reginald, it's nothing of the kind. Only I'm sure Mrs. McKillop would be pleased if I brought you. Young men of your brilliant attractions are rather at a premium at her garden parties. Should be at a premium in heaven, remarked Reginald complacently. There will be very few of you there, if that is what you mean. But seriously, there won't be any great strain upon your powers of endurance. I promise that you shan't have to play croquet or talk to the archdeacon's wife or do anything that is likely to bring on physical prostration. You can just wear your sweetest clothes and a moderately amiable expression and eat chocolate creams with the appetite of a blasé parrot. Nothing more is demanded of you. Reginald shut his eyes. There will be the exhaustingly up-to-date young women who will ask me if I have seen San Toy, a less progressive grade who will yearn to hear about the Diamond Jubilee, the historic event, not the horse. With a little encouragement, they will inquire if I saw the Allies march into Paris. Why are women so fond of raking up the past? They're as bad as tailors, who invariably remember what you owe them for a suit long after you've ceased to wear it. I'll order lunch for one o'clock. That will give you two and a half hours to dress in. Reginald puckered his brow into a tortured frown, and I knew that my point was gained. He was debating what tie would go with which waistcoat. Even then I had my misgivings. During the drive to the McKillops, Reginald was possessed with a great peace, which was not wholly to be accounted for by the fact that he had inveigled his feet into shoes a size too small for them. I misgave more than ever, and having once launched Reginald onto the McKillop's lawn, I established him near a seductive dish of marron glacé, and as far from the archdeacon's wife as possible. As I drifted away to a diplomatic distance, I heard with painful distinctness the eldest Mockby girl asking him if he had seen San Toy. It must have been ten minutes later, not more, and I had been having quite an enjoyable chat with my hostess and had promised to lend her the Eternal City in my recipe for rabbit mayonnaise, and was just about to offer a kind home for her third Persian kitten when I perceived, out of the corner of my eye, that Reginald was not where I had left him, and that the marron glacé were untasted. At the same moment I became aware that old Colonel Mendoza was essaying to tell his classic story of how he introduced golf into India, and that Reginald was in dangerous proximity. There are occasions when Reginald is caviar to the colonel. When I was at Pune in 76, my dear colonel, purred Reginald, fancy admitting such a thing, such a giveaway for one's age. I wouldn't admit being on this planet in 76. Reginald, in his wildest lapses into veracity, never admits to being more than 22. The colonel went to the color of a fig that has attained great ripeness, and Reginald, ignoring my efforts to intercept him, glided away to another part of the lawn. I found him a few minutes later happily engaged in teaching the youngest rampage boy the approved theory of mixing absinthe, within full earshot of his mother. Mrs. Rampage occupies a prominent place in local temperance movements. As soon as I had broken up this unpromising tete-a-tete -tete and settled Reginald where he could watch the croquet players losing their tempers, I wandered off to find my hostess, and renew the kitten negotiations at the point where they had been interrupted. I did not succeed in running her down at once, and eventually it was Mrs. McKillop who sought me out, and her conversation was not of kittens. Your cousin is discussing Zaza with the archdeacon's wife. At least he is discussing. She is ordering her carriage. She spoke in the dry staccato tone of one who repeats a French exercise, and I knew 
that as far as Millie MacKillop was concerned, Wumples was devoted to a lifelong celibacy. If you don't mind, I said hurriedly, I think we'd like our carriage ordered too, and I made a forced march in the direction of the croquet ground. I found everyone talking nervously and feverishly of the weather and the war in South Africa, except Reginald, who was reclining in a comfortable chair with the dreamy, faraway look that a volcano might wear just after it had desolated entire villages. The archdeacon's wife was buttoning up her gloves with a concentrated deliberation that was fearful to behold. I shall have to treble my subscription to her cheerful Sunday evenings fund before I dare set foot in her house again. At that particular moment, the croquet players finished their game, which had been going on without a symptom of finality during the whole afternoon. Why, I ask, should it have stopped precisely when a counter-attraction was so necessary? Everyone seemed to drift towards the area of disturbance, of which the chairs of the archdeacon's wife and Reginald formed the storm center. Conversation flagged, and there settled upon the company that expectant hush that precedes the dawn, when your neighbors don't happen to keep poultry. What did the Caspian see? asked Reginald with appalling suddenness. There were symptoms of a stampede. The archdeacon's wife looked at me. Kipling or someone has described somewhere the look a foundered camel gives when the caravan moves on and leaves it to its fate. The peptonized reproach in the good lady's eyes brought the passage vividly to mind. I played my last card. Reginald, it's getting late, and a sea mist is coming on. I knew that the elaborate curl over his right eyebrow was not guaranteed to survive a sea mist. Never, never again will I take you to a garden party. Never. You behaved abominably. What did the Caspian see? A shade of genuine regret for misused opportunities passed over Reginald's face. After all, he said, I believe an apricot tie would have gone better with the lilac waistcoat. Reginald by Saki